Hello. So in this video, we're going to be talking about Sean Cunningham's Friday the 13th. Now, this is the original Friday the 13th movie from 1980, uh, not any of the various other films in that franchise. Um, so in particular, what I'm going to be talking about is the uh, sexual and psychoanalytic elements of this film because this is a film very much filled with anxiety about sex, sexuality, and the loss of, of sexuality. So the basic premise of Friday the 13th um, is that there is a camp, Crystal Lake, uh, in the 1950s, a boy had drowned, a boy named Jason Voorhees, um, and then in the subsequent year, camp counselors were murdered. So the camp was shut down. Now, later on, late 70s, um, the camp is, is being reopened by Ned, um, or sorry, by, by uh, Steve Christie. Um, basically, the, the goal of the camp is to, the goal of reopening the camp is to sort of get over the previous tragedies and the, and the, negative reputation that the camp has in the local area. But Steve brings in a bunch of counselors and they all pretty much get murdered. Uh, so Steve gets murdered. Um, the other sets of uh, camp counselors, most of whom are somewhat free-spirited teenagers, we'll put it that way. Um, some of them actually do have sex. Some of them play strip monopoly. Some of them smoke pot. So you know what? These are all meant to be sort of symbols of their like freewheeling, happy lifestyle or whatever it is. Um, and they, they all get murdered over the course of this film. Realistically, with a couple of exceptions, Annie gets murdered beforehand, um, but basically they all get murdered in one night. Um, we find out at the end of the movie that this is a spoiler in case you haven't seen this film from 1980. Um, we find out at the end of the movie that the killer is Mrs. Voorhees, Pamela Voorhees. As we, I don't, we don't learn her name, her first name. I think in this movie, we just, she just refers to herself as Mrs. Voorhees. Um, but in subsequent films, we do learn that her name is Pamela and she has been killing uh, these counselors because her son, Jason, was the one who had drowned. And she believes, with whatever justification there is for this, that he drowned because the counselors who were supposed to be watching him had snuck off to have sex. So now she definitely kills counselors who are having sex with one another, but she kills the camp counselors just in general. That being said, Pretty much all of the counsel counselors are somewhat sexually active. Um, two of them, I think it's uh, Brenda and Jack, actually do have sex with each other. They're they're a proper couple. Um, several of the others play strip poker. Actually, in or uh, strip monopoly. Sorry. Um, Bill and Marcy are, are sort of involved in that. Alice is actually involved in that as well, but Alice doesn't take any of her clothes off. Um, and Bill actually asks whether or not she would have if, uh, if her, if she had landed on, on somebody's um, owned property or something like this. And she's like, yeah, I'm not sure. Alice also resisted the sexual advances of Steve. So she is the most sort of virginal and pure of this. And so a lot of people read this as she gets to survive. She, she is what's called the final girl in, in horror terminology. Um, she is the, the final person who often kills the, uh, the, the killer or at the very least survives the killer's attack. And, and Alice helps set this pattern of the final girl being at least more virginal than everybody else. Um, and, and to a certain extent, slightly more 
androgynous. Um, so Alice has a, a fairly short haircut. Um, she's not especially like flirtatious or anything like that. Um, she seems to be more at the level of just like, I'm here, I'm doing this work. I may or may not end up staying on. So she, she's, she is less interpersonally engaged than the others. And so that's one reading that a lot of people have, particularly feminists have of the horror genre, the slasher film genre, is that the final girl, which in this case, again, is Alice, is usually more virginal and has more sort of masculine or an androgynous traits than many of the other characters. So that's one element of this. Um, there is also a pervading throughout this film um, concern about sexuality and reproduction. And this is a very psychoanalytically rooted anxiety. Um, Mrs. Voorhees murders counselors because her son drowned and she blames the counselor. She blames their sexuality for that loss. So if we read this from a, a psychoanalytic perspective where we're looking at symbols and anxieties, her anxiety, her, the loss of her child is here associated with sex. And so sex must be punished. This is, of course, a, a sort of puritanical component of the film, as we see in many slasher films. Um, Halloween, Nightmare on Elm Street, um, films like this, we have this sort of pervading sense that sexuality, sex must be punished by the killer. And we definitely get that in this film. And this, I think, actually goes back to um, to Hitchcock's Psycho, right? Which is, I think, a major, major intertext for this film, for Friday the 13th. Um, this idea of the characters that reflect sexuality, <clears throat> that are in some way sexually active or liberated, must be destroyed by the killer. This is very much an intertext here. Um, and, and I'll talk more about the, the psycho connection in a little bit. Um, <clears throat> so that's, that's definitely one component, the punishment of sexuality. But that point I had made a little while ago about Mrs. Voorhees linking the death of her son with sex is a really interesting one because I think this is our first overt indication of castration anxiety. So castration anxiety in psychoanalytic theory is basically the, the fear of the loss of power or the loss of, I mean, the loss of sexual potency, but sexual potency sort of writ large, not necessarily just something, um, a physiological problem like erectile dysfunction or something like this, but the loss of status or the loss of sort of existential meaning are also associated with castration anxiety. And so if Mrs. Voorhees, if her identity was rooted in being a mother, and we don't have a good sense of that from this film, like we don't know what she was like prior to Jason's death. We don't know what their relationship was like. But we know that after his death, she becomes so obsessed about this that she murders a whole bunch of people. And so that element, that idea that like, the loss of Jason is in some sense, a loss of her identity, that her identity is compromised, suggests that her identity was somehow fundamentally wrapped up in being a mother. And so this is a sexual identity. This is a reproductive identity. If she is defining herself according to her sexually reproductive capability, and that is now lost, the child that was the symbol of her 
uh, reproductive ability, her, her sexual potency has been lost, then that is, in a sense, a form of castration anxiety, not as directly a, a, a form as like the loss of the penis per se, but it very much is a kind of now her identity is cut. It is, it, and this is another sort of psychoanalytic idea that comes from Lacan, this idea of the, the subject who is cut. Um, the, the subject who is no longer existentially whole in some way because of the experience of castration. So in this case, the loss of the child is her first instance of castration. And because of that, she actually loses her identity as such. And this is the other big sort of con connection with Psycho, because right in Psycho, Norman Bates his mother was so domineering, so dominating of his life that after she dies, he internalizes her voice and develops this kind of double personality in which he's both himself and his mother. In Friday the 13th, we get the same thing with Pamela Voorhees. She is both herself and her son. And as she confronts Alice, I mean, this is one of the most unnerving elements of the film, right? As she confronts Alice, she has this sort of psychotic conversations with herself as Jason in which she, from, from Jason's voice, is urging herself to kill. And from her own voice, she is committing to do that. So that idea, again, of like the divided identity, the existential loss of self caused by the experience of the symbolic castration is really evident in the film. And it underlies the entire premise of the film that she murders because she is a castrated subject. Uh, she murders because she has lost her reproductive ability or lost her, her uh, sexual potency in some sense, right? And this is really interesting, I think, because in actuality, um, so, so Betsy Palmer played Pamela Voorhees in the original movie, but she actually isn't the killer throughout much of it. The actual, the, the actual person that we see in shadow or that we see sort of the boots of things like this throughout the film was actually played by a male actor. Um, it, it wasn't, it wasn't Betsy Palmer who did most of that filming. It was a male actor. And then Betsy Palmer was really only in the scenes with Alice at the end of the movie where she and Alice directly fight one another. So that idea of Pamela Voorhees as this masculine figure, but also not fully masculine, is really, really significant in the, the casting choices of the film. Also in the choice of weaponry. I mean, the weapons that Pamela uses, the weapons that Mrs. Voorhees uses are penetrating weapons. Arrows, knives, um, machetes, even the axe, in a way, is a penetrating weapon. It's not a piercing weapon as such, and so it's not quite as clearly um, a sort of... It's not a phallic weapon in quite the same way. It, it doesn't enter the body uh, in, in a way that's sort of visually evocative of the penis, but it does create a gaping wound. It creates a wound that is not entirely dissimilar in appearance to the vagina. And so that's a really interesting element, particularly since um, the person most overtly killed with an ax, I think is Brenda, who gets, who, who, is, who is the one, the one woman in this uh, film who actually does have sex on screen uh, with Jack. Jack gets penetrated. He has an arrow that, gets pushed through the, the back of his neck and comes out the front of his throat. 
And so again, there is that sort of penile penetration representation. Um, Annie, who's an interesting figure because she seems to be sexualized by others more than, than herself being sexualized, she has her throat cut. And again, there's a sort of visual evocation of a sort of separating wound there that, that can be seen to, to look vaginal. So there are these sort of interesting visual elements that suggest that Pamela Voorhees is unconsciously at least, or, or realistically Sean Cunningham probably, uh, is aware of the, the psychosexual dimensions of this film. But then the last thing I think that's really, really interesting in terms of the, the psychosexual economy and, and castration anxiety in particular um, is the conclusion. What happens to Pamela Voorhees at the end of the film? So Pamela, Pamela comes to save Alice, Alice thinks she's being saved. In fact, Pamela is the killer. Uh, um, and so they have a very extended fight scene in which they they beat one another up multiple times. Alice flees. Um, Mrs. Voorhees relentlessly pursues, etc., etc. Standard horror movie stuff. There was one thing that I did notice that I thought was really interesting, that um, in one of their fights, in this sort of I don't know, storage room where they keep the rifles for the camp and, and Alice is trying to get a rifle, trying to load it, but she can't get to the bullets. But in one of the fights in that room, Alice kicks Mrs. Voorhees between the legs. She kicks her in the crotch, which of course is going to hurt a woman, but that is very much a more effective fighting move when fighting a male antagonist. So I think that was a really interesting thing. But ultimately, um, on the shore of the lake where Jason had drowned, Mrs. Voorhees comes at Alice with a machete. They struggle. Alice gets the machete away and she cuts Mrs. Voorhees' head off. You want to talk about a symbol for castration anxiety? A beheading is the symbol for castration anxiety. Right. And so this is the, the interesting thing is in a way, Mrs. Voorhees' experience as the killer is bookended by these two forms of castration. The initial castration of losing her son, that loss of sexual identity, motherhood, and then the loss of the head, the cutting off of the head, which again is in psychoanalytic terms, very much a symbol for fearing the loss of the penis or the loss of what the penis represents, sexual potency, identity, power, etc., etc. And so her experiences as the killer are bookended by these two symbols of castration. These are the two things that sort of start and end her journey as killer. I think it's really, really interesting. It's a, it's a, a film haunted by the idea of sex, sexuality, castration, anxiety, the loss of sexual potency, etc., etc. Really fascinating stuff.